Have you been wanting to play Barbarian, but you're afraid that it might just be too simple for you? That you'd like to have something a bit more challenging? Well, you're in luck. Because behind today's secret door, the path of wild magic Barbarian test drive. So behind today's secret door, the path of wild magic barbarian test drive. This is Secret Door, a channel devoted to in-depth discussions about Dungeons and Dragons, and my name is Matt Morich. Before we get started, I'd just like to point out I have started a Patreon, so if you've been considering supporting the channel, please do give it a look. It would be greatly appreciated. The link will be in the description and in the pinned comment. So a test drive is exactly what it sounds like. It's your chance to be able to see what a character will play like level by level and be able to compare it to other characters and see just how well it stacks up. Now, normally I say it's rather buildish and it's kind of guidish. This one's going to be probably a bit more guidish because the build part of it is pretty minor. There's not a whole lot of choices to make. It's, so it's more of an analysis of how how the class plays by itself, but there's plenty there to look at. Normally, I also talk about role-playing considerations, and I might touch on that here as well, but I have done a video called Be a Better Barbarian, and the link for that will be in the description and in the pinned comment as well. If you're inter that, That's just about role-playing a barbarian. So if you're interested in something like that, that's the video to look at. So I'll be shocked if this doesn't turn out to be the quickest of all the test drives I've done so far, because there's not a whole lot of choices to make. So there's not a lot to explain other than what's in the class itself. So I see my job as examining how the class does play and relaying that to you so you get a feel of how it's going to play out, if this is something that's even worth looking at. Because of all the paths for a barbarian, this one is the weirdest. It's a challenging barbarian to play because you never know what you're going to get. So for that reason, it's it's very normal to want to consider giving the barbarian to a beginner. And you, you could still do that with wild magic, but I see the wild magic barbarian as being the barbarian for a very experienced player that wants to play a barbarian, a player that can roll with whatever punches happen to them, because you're not going to know what you're going to be like in a combat until you rage. So for that reason, I, w I would warn against giving this to a beginner because I just feel that a lot that the class has to offer might just be missed. I mean, it will still play great. It's still a barbarian. The the it, it's going to play just like every other barbarian. So don't get too worried about it. But beginners is just likely to miss the some of the opportunities that this random rage effect is going to offer. But all that being said, there's an enormous amount of fun in not knowing what you're going to get until you. Roll. It's kind of like having Christmas. Every 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 combat's kind of like a Christmas for any D and D player, but for a wild magic barbarian, it really is a, a Christmas, a birthday, whatever. You just don't know what you're going to get. I love barbarians. Some of the most complex characters I've ever created were barbarians. So you can play a barbarian however you want. And like I said, check out Be a Better Barbarian for all my thoughts on on that. So like I said, I would imagine this will be a, a rather quick test drive. I'm going to go probably more in depth from levels one through six and then levels seven through 14 should be very, very quick. I'll probably just be doing them bop, 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 because the, the barbarian class itself doesn't have anything terribly complex. 
from level seven forward. And then the, the primal path features offered here, uh, the later features are, are not complex at all. Okay, so let's just get to it. So I'm going to recommend that you go human variant or custom lineage, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for one very important mechanical reason, and that is that you want that feat at first level, and you obviously want to take Great Weapon Master. You do not want to take Polearm Master with this character because some of the rage effects, a, a significant number of them will ask for bonus actions to use them. A Barbarian already has a problem in the first round with Polearm Master anyway, because rage requires a bonus action to activate. So already Polearm Master is at a disadvantage there. And later rounds, if you want to use what you're getting from your rage, you're going to be in that predicament if you if you roll one of those. So I'm going to say, I'm going to stay away from Polearm Master and just stick with Great Weapon Master, which is the feat that you'll take with either one. For the, for the sake of this, I'm going to pick a human variant. If we were to do point by, if it were me, and it really won't matter and the, how the stats work out other than strength, won't really matter for the course of this test drive but i would go with a 15 two 15s one in strength and one in con and then obviously to put the two plus ones there to get two 16s the reason being obviously and every barbarian loves having a high con this one three of the eight possibilities for your rage effects offer saving throw dcs that are based on your constitution but if you didn't want to go with Two fifteens, then you could certainly go with the standard array would work just fine and take 15, a 14, and, and a 13, make the 13 a 14, and uh, put those both in, in dex and con, and you've got a 14 dex and a 14 con. The problem with doing the two 15s is that the dex will probably suffer because you're going to want the wisdom to be there. I would normally say 12 and 12 for dex and, and wisdom if you took the two 15s. Your your armor class will suffer a little bit once you get me good medium armor. You're not going to get the maximum value out of it, but I'm not really too worried about my armor class as a barbarian. I'm going to be using reckless attack all the time, and if I'm using reckless attack all the time, I'm probably going to get hit anyway. So I, I you obviously want your armor class to be as high as possible, so you can you don't have to take as many hits. But since you're giving advantage to everybody that tries to attack you, you're get, you're just going to have to deal with the fact that you're, you're going to get hit. So all things being equal then, if the dex isn't going to give me a, a, a normal advantage with, with armor class, I'd rather have the hit points and I'd rather have my DCs for the saves when I get those effects that require saving throws, which are some of the best ones you could get anyway. I want those to have the best possible effect. So human variant, uh, great weapon master, that's really all we need to worry about here. So with the barbarian, of course, we get the D12, which means that if you did go with a, a 50, uh, I'm sorry, a 16 constitution, then you're going to have 15 starting hit points, which is really nice. And you, if you went with the averages from there on, you're getting 10 hit points a level. That's important to note. Just keep that in your mind because I... I'm not going to reference how many hit points we have level by level, but you need all the hit points you can get as a barbarian. <laughs> uh, ideally speaking, this class, normally a barbarian, a very often I should say, very often a barbarian is not only a frontline fighter, but is is holding a line as a, as a defensive bulwark for the party. But that depends on party composition and that depends on playing styles and blah, 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 blah. So ideally speaking, if you were playing a Path of the Wild Magic Barbarian, you don't want to have to be the frontline defender. Although there are going to be rage effects that you'll get that will make that excellent to do. My point is, is that you want the option to be able to switch. As soon as you find out what you've got from your rage, you want to be able to make that choice right then and there. And knowing what powers will work with what playing style is important. And I'll spend most of my time talking about just that. 
So we're not even going to get, of course, the wild magic effect of the Barbarian until we hit third level. So at first level, we're getting uh, Rage, which operates just completely as a normal Rage. And we get Unarmored Defense. Unarmored Defense, it's nice to have uh, in a pinch. Of course, it's always nice. I'm going to suggest, of course, that you get the very best armor you can get. You don't suffer any penalties for having it. So just get the very best armor that you can get. You get medium armor. So get the best armor as soon as you can afford it. Because we have Great Weapon Master, I'm going to be assuming a great sword for this. It it only matters in the math that I'm going to be presenting to you. So Rage, just very quickly, of course, I'm not going to describe every little thing about Rage, but it takes a bonus action to activate. Just keep that in mind. Any of the later effects that you're going to get from your Rage will activate already, even if they're bonus, act bonus actions to activate them, they'll still activate on your first round. So you want to avoid anything else that's going to be stacking against that bonus action. And of course, while you're raging, you have resistance to uh, slashing, bludgeoning, and piercing damage, which is fantastic. And you can't concentrate on spells. You can't cast spells, blah, 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 blah. But those, the, the main components here are the damage resistance. That bonus action is important to remember. And the other really big sticking point. And this is the most important thing to remember about rage, other than that bonus action to activate, in my opinion. You've only got two. Now, a rage, most of the time, 99% of the time in your career, your rage will last for the entire combat. There are situations that might knock you out of your rage. Uh, those are going to be very circumstantial. It should last for a combat. But you've only got two. And I assume an average of three encounters a day, each lasting about four rounds. But even in that assumption, it could be... Of course, it could be less. You might only have two, uh, but you could easily have four. You could have five. That's certainly possible. So this idea that on average, I think you're already behind the eight ball at first level because half of what, not half, almost everything you do is rage dependent. I don't understand why they put such a restriction on the rages. Quite honestly, I don't see it as that overwhelmingly powerful. It becomes kind of an assumed as the character moves along. But starting out at first level, you're really behind the eight ball. So you, you have to pick your spots when you're going to rage, especially here at first level, when if it's rage worthy of a combat. Do you need it? That's really the question. And when you rage, of course, you're also going to be getting a plus two damage, uh, plus two to every attack in this. Right now, you only have one attack. And talking about whether or not to use Great Weapon Master here at first level is important. If you're facing a low armor class opponent, uh, go ahead and use it. But it it barely breaks even at, at, at first level to use it in most cases. You're not behind the curve with your strength. You're right at the curve. So that's great. But that minus five really hurts. And you don't have reckless attack until next level. So here at first level, even though you've got great weapon master, I would only recommend using it if if the target was a, was a known low armor class target. Undead often have very low armor classes. Beasts often have very low armor classes. Things of that nature. Or obviously, if a character or a, an opponent is somehow restrained or something like that, then obviously. But the other really big point to remember is even though you're not, you may or may not be using the the plus ten to damage that you're going to receive from Great Weapon Master for accepting that penalty. You get a bonus action attack every time you critical, or you drop an opponent to zero. That happens whether you're using it or not. So if you if either of those two things should happen, then you get a bonus action at, to attack. This is yet another reason why I wanted to avoid uh, it, to to keep it as small of a chance as possible because it is possible that round one you've activated your 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 rage, 
and you swing with the great sword and you crit or maybe you even drop the uh, on the on the first swing you drop the the opponent that first round you're not going to get that extra attack and that really stinks and that's going to happen throughout your career that those times will happen they're not going to happen every every combat of course but they will happen and you just have to live with that but all things being equal i think that it's fair to say that you you should be able to expect one of those two things to happen probably once per combat, I think is a relatively safe assumption. So whatever number I quote you, either take it in half as a possibility for what you would do if you got that extra attack, or from levels one through four, whatever the number is that I quote you, that's what you would do if you got the bonus action attack. That's going to be important to note because... Coming at third level, again, we're going to have those things that are going to be going up against bonus actions. That could be that you have one of those rage effects and then you crit or you drop something to zero and now you have to make a choice. Do I use the rage power or do I take the swing? And probably I would say take the swing. But there might be circumstances where the, the rage power is more important to use. It could, it, it could be. All that being said, your damage per round would be about 8.75, which is pretty darn good at first level. It's very, very, it's very, very, very good. Your damage is going to be very, very, very good. You're not going to be consistently, as consistently great as something like a Zealot Barbarian, which is always getting a D6 added, but you're going to have plenty of effects that do that same thing. And we'll get there at third level. Uh, What you're getting is the possibility... Instead of just having that every combat, you have the possibility of also having some control effects and some extra tanking effects and stuff like that. So you never know what you're going to get, but there are plenty that provide extra damage as well. And even if you don't have one of those effects, your your damage is going to be very high end. And coming along here at second level, you get Reckless Attack and Danger Sense. Reckless Attack is, of course, the big get. Uh, When you use this, you can choose to have advantage whenever you're attacking, but whenever you do so, you're granting your opponent, whoever's hitting you, advantage as well. But that advantage will counterbalance the minus five because you are with the curve. It will will counterbalance that minus five and you will be hitting at the curve. Now, danger sense is one of those things that people just don't think about when they think about barbarians very often. And that is you get advantage on your saving throws for dexterity against effects that you can see. And it specifically mentions traps and spells. Now spells, that seems rather obvious to me, but traps often you don't see them coming. So the fact that they even mention it in the book as a player I would always be pointing that out to the DM if the DM's denying us. Well, the book says that (laughs) it works against traps. I would definitely make that case. Um, It just seems odd that the very nature of a trap is that you don't see it and yet they mention it specifically. So I, anyway, it says that you can. So having advantage on dex saving throws is, is a really nice thing. Dex saving throws are extremely common and anytime you can get advantage on saving throws, that's a huge get. But if you are blinded, deafened, or incapacitated, you don't get the the benefit of danger sense. Now, with reckless attack, I in all the damage that I'm going to be quoting to you from here on forward, I'm assuming that you're using reckless attack all the time, and you're using great weapon master all the time. Because you are hitting at the curve, there's very little reason I can ever see why you would not be using great weapon master. Uh, there's another point here that I, I failed to mention when I was talking about Great Weapon Master earlier. I think that it's critical for this, of all the paths for a barbarian, Great Weapon, I mean, pretty much every barbarian is going to take it. But in particular, the the Path of Wild Magic has the opportunity to actually be the true master of Great Weapon Master. Now, using Reckless Attack, your damage jumps to 13.9 <laughs> at second level. So um, just remember that anytime you drop an opponent or you critical, you get to be able to pretty much do that damage again that round, provided you have a bonus action available to you. 
So if that happens once in a, in, in a combat, that 13.9 divided by the theoretical four, you're, you know, you're looking at three point, almost 3.5 extra in damage. I don't calculate that into any of these damage scores because of how it's all going to play out. I just want to point out that you could very easily mathematically put that in there. But because of all the possible moving parts here, I just want to point them out that it's pretty much you can put that in the bank. that It should happen. But you never know with with dropping someone to zero. Maybe you almost do it and then your ally does it and, and criticals you. Of course, you just never know. So it, it could happen multiple times in a combat or, a, or a, and it could happen not at all in a combat. But I think about once per combat is pretty fair. Okay, so level three, this is where everything really happens for this character. So level three, we get a Wild Surge, which allows you whenever you enter your rage, you roll once on the Wild Magic table for the Barbarian. You roll a D8. There are eight possible effects, and I will go through all of them with you. I'm not just going to read from the book to you, but I'll just give you the uh, what what the what the power does and what I would think the best use of it is and what how you should be looking at what your possible optimal play style is if that's what you roll. So the table has eight possible rolls. Three of them are what I would consider to be very good. Uh, if you got any one of those three, then they could possibly alter an encounter by themselves. Four of them are in various degrees of good and one of them is okay. So you're never going to get an awful roll. Even the one that's simply okay is still useful. It's just not as good as the others. So this is not at all like the path, uh, the wild magic sorcerer with all those possibilities. And there's so many on that table that are bad. You don't have anything bad. Only, only something useful will happen. So on a roll of one, you get black tendrils. This means that uh, any creature within 30 feet of you has to make a constitution saving throw. If they fail the saving throw, they take a d12 in necrotic damage. You also get a d12 in temporary hit points. Now, that's great because a barbarian with an AoE is just amazingly cool, but, but it's important to remember that it's within 30 feet of you. So depending on your situation, it's going to be my rule of thumb for a wild magic barbarian that you never, ever enter your rage without being within 30 feet of at least one opponent. And I would I would wager it's going to be best to have three within that 30 foot range. And if you could have an optimal target within that 30 feet, that's even better. But for something like this, with the, uh, the possibility of having an area of effect attack like that, and a D12, I mean, here we are at third level. Hit points are not getting co completely out of hand just yet. A D12 on a failed save is, you know, a six and a half points of damage. That's significant when you're talking about an AOE for that you're getting for free and you're getting that those temporary hit points. And I should also make that point as well, that, of course, for any barbarian... Temporary hit points are amazing because they kind of go twice as far because of the damage reduction from rage. So you're possibly dealing a, a nice blow to the opponents and gaining temporary hit points all in one go. This all just happens once and then it's done. So there is no repeat effect here because it isn't a save for half. It's a save for no damage. And your average roll is going to be 6.5. Then you're going to say that on average you'll do three and a quarter per target. So if you have three targets, that's almost 10 points of extra damage in that round. That's very good. But possibly the biggest get of it really is the temporary hit points. Now with the Black Tendrils, I would say that in early at level three and level four, uh, it's probably borderline with the top three because of the temporary hit points and how they're going to play out and the amount of kind of damage you're going to be taking and getting an AOE, doing a D12. 
it's still going to be a very good one, but its value will go down as you level up. Now, on a roll of two, you gain teleport. And you're able to teleport. It's basically Misty Step. It's a bonus action, 30 feet to a space, unoccupied space you can see. You can do it on every bonus action while you are raging with this effect. Wow. That's amazingly good. That is one, this is one of the three that I would say could change an encounter. And the reason why it can change an encounter, and this is why I talked about being flexible earlier, is this will allow you to get to a high value target no matter what. Maybe it'll even take you two rounds to get there, but I doubt it. You'll, you should be able to get right to a high value target immediately because you gain the teleport even when you rage. So because of this, because you are teleporting as soon as you rage, it's important, like I said before, being within 30 feet of a target, if targets are within 30 feet of you already and you have this teleport now, now you could get right over that line and get to the high value targets right away because you might still have some move action left available to you, et cetera, et cetera. It's... And the fact that you can use it over and over and over again, you, you, you may or may not want to. That one teleport may be sufficient, but the fact that you can is great. So being a frontline defender here, this is not going to be very useful to you. If you are playing a traditional tank role all the time for the party, this is potentially a wasted role. Um, even in that role as a frontline defender, you still could find uses for it. Sometimes you just have to reform and everything else, reform the, the lines that, and where the, the enemy flees. Or all kinds of things can go wrong in a combat where having a teleport could be handy. But in general, uh, if you are playing a frontline defender all the time, this would be a wasted role. But for anybody else... This is this is a potentially uh, encounter-ending thing. You can get right after spellcasters right away. Just great, 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 great. On a roll of three, you summon a pixie or a flump. It's your choice. Uh, a spirit that takes the form of those, I believe, uh, to an unoccupied space that you can see within 30 feet of you, within five feet of a creature that you can see. So that could be tricky, of where to put it. You may not be able to put it exactly where you want to, but you probably will. At the end of the current turn, that spirit explodes and any creature within five feet of it must make a dexterity saving throw or take 1d6 force damage. This is one that I consider only very good, even though it is area of effect, and here's why I only... Uh, rank it as very good, is that the timing of it could be very tricky. It could be incredibly easy. It just, it's, it's not always going to be easy and it, it's not always going to be tricky. So it's, for that reason, it, it can be kind of undependable. So what I mean by that is, obviously, if you're going at the end of the round, this is cake. You, you summon it and it goes off almost right away. So and if you're going towards the end of, of combat rounds, it's fantastic. Fantastic. But if, if you're going early or mid-round, they're going to be able to react. Whether they know what to do is going to be the question, whether the DM metagames with that or not. After the first explosion, it would be reasonable because you can keep summoning them as long as the rage uh, persists. So probably any kind of DM with any self-respect would not move after the uh, with the first one. But after that, it's reasonable to assume that they could see that again and go, oh no. And, and if they had the option to flee, they could. So for that reason, it can be difficult for this to actually land. But the first time, you probably can get it to land. But if you can get it to land repeatedly, this is this is great. And it's interesting to point out as well that this is a real nuisance for casters because if you were able to pull this off against a caster, that's another concentration save they have to make if they if they have a concentration spell going and they fail that dexterity save. 
So it, it's because you've got a range of 30 feet with it. If you're within 30 feet of a caster, you can really make that caster's life a nightmare. Now, on a roll of four, your weapon is infused with magic and it gains the light and throne properties and has a normal range of 20 feet and a longer range of 60 feet. That That's great. And you can throw it and that's that's flexible and useful. But I think probably the greatest advantage to it, sadly, is that the weapon's damage type changes to force. Since... Resistance to slashing, or if you want with the maul, bludgeoning, or whatever, is going to be more common. Certainly, resistance to force is almost non-existent. So that's why the this may be the best quality of this ability. That being said, having the option to be able to throw a great sword 20 feet <laughs> Is, you know, there's a certain cinematic quality to that. And obviously, tactically, it could be useful. Uh, this is, I would consider, the weakest of the abilities, though. But having said that, it's still not, it's not bad. It's just not overwhelmingly great. But in the right situation, it could be fantastic. So it just, if that kind of circumstances arises and you roll four, well, you're in, you're in business. But at number five, we get another great one, and that is whenever a creature hits you while you are raging, they take a d6 in force damage as magic lashes back out at them. That's fantastic. You're giving your opponent an advantage anyway, so if you were to get hit two or three times in a round, that's certainly possible. Uh, that's two or three extra d6s of damage. There's no save, no nothing. They just take it. Fantastic ability. And even if it were just a single uh, opponent, that's uh, the D6. Again, That if, if we were to compare that to what the Zealot gets, they get a single D6 extra damage per round. So this would be at least that and could be much better than that. But I should point out that this works when a creature hits you with an attack roll. So that could be if you were to be hit by a ranged attack, they're taking a D6. So on a roll of six, we get another one where your play style may want to change if you roll this number because your armor class goes up by plus one. That's okay. But you now generate a 10-foot aura and any of your allies that you choose to give it to will also receive a plus one to your AC. So now you're playing kind of like a paladin to a certain degree. So now you definitely don't want to be running off and being a, a, a striker. Unless, of course, it demands that you do that. If, if, if the combat you're in, everything that I'm saying here about your play style changing and all that, if, you, if the combat requires you to do this to win the combat, to go do something else other than what the rage effect is, don't be held prisoner by the rage effect by any means. Go do the thing that you need to do to win that fight. But... All things being equal, if you can play within that, with with what the power is naturally going to make you better at, then that's great. So not not only are you going to get hit a little bit less with the plus one, not like I said, it's not great, but you're giving that bonus to all of your allies, and that's that's great. And this just stacks with everything, so it's 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 a good solid ability. So on a roll of seven. Vines and flowers grow out of the ground and the ground become within 15 feet of you. And so the, the ground now becomes difficult terrain for your enemies. Now, this is a very, very, very good ability if you, if you can make great use of it. Just remember that, that that's a much bigger area than it sounds like because that's a 15-foot radius coming off of you, which means... That's three squares here, three squares here, and you're the square. So that's a total of seven squares in diameter. So we're talking about, other than the square you're in, that's 48 other squares of difficult terrain you've now created. for, And that only affects your enemies and not, not your allies. And that's also great. So your ability to tank, create 
real problems for the enemy with something like this is is great. It can it's hard to describe if it, it's hard to rank, I should say, how good this can be. It can be devastatingly great and or it could simply just be good to very good. I personally think that it's going to come out to be great very often, but it, it's hard to truly rank it. So this this one does remain within that four that I consider to be very good, but it, it could easily be in the category of great. So you've got two in that four that could be in the in the in the great category, which means that you'd be looking at potentially five out of the eight possible roles being fantastic outcomes. So bear that in mind. This this table is surprisingly good. And if you roll an eight, a beam of light emits from your chest and a target that you choose within 30 feet of you must make a constitution saving throw or take a d6 in radiant damage and be blinded until the start of your next turn. You can repeat this action every turn while the rage persists as a bonus action. This is clearly the strongest of the abilities because not only are you doing possibly a little bit of damage every round, the big deal, of course, is the possibility of putting on the blinded condition, which is really debilitating. If you were to hit casters with this, a lot of spells require sight to be able to uh, a, a target you can see is often in the spell's description in almost all of them. So <laughs> it's it's really a problem against casters, and it's a problem for anybody. So just a fantastic uh, encounter-altering, possibly, ability, truly one of the three. This would be the jackpot roll. Uh, the damage back every round is a jackpot roll. The teleport, in my opinion, is a jackpot roll. But that... that uh, ground area, the difficult terrain, fantastic. The the flum for the pixie could be fantastic. So there's there's just up and down. The only real bummer one is the is the if you roll the four and it's the thrown weapon. But at least then you're converting it to force damage, and that's something. So playing a character like this is is really a big ask for a player because you want your abilities to be something you can always rely on. But a barbarian is the soul of reliability with their powers already. So the fact that you get the chance to have really different powers available to you, once you can see that just about anything you roll is going to be something you can work with. If you're the kind of player that can be flexible in their playing style, you can really take great advantage of this. It'd be a lot of fun. But that being said, it could really be frustrating for players as well. So it really does require, you have to, you have to really want this. It isn't going to be something that mechanically drives you to it because there's just no telling how how and when you're going to get those outcomes that you want on the on the on the table in essence you can see that it will aid you if you want to be a defender a bulwark defender with the terrain or with the armor class if you want to go be uh, a striker and be hitting high value targets with the teleport that's going to be an option you have control effects again with the the ground is difficult terrain with it, to some degree, even the flump or the pixie are a kind of control effect and that you could be steering them away from certain areas. And of course, with the blinded condition, that's a fantastic control effect or debuff effect, I, sh I guess I should say. But all that being said, of course, the, the key word is, of course, flexibility. If you can be flexible, you can really get a lot of value out of this character. And of course, here at level three, uh, we... One of the big gets is that we get three rages a day now, so we don't have to worry so much about having to ration rages. So you should have enough to get through most adventuring days. Level four, you'll get your ASI. You'll want to put that into a strength, so you'll have an 18 strength, and that will bump your damage to 14.5. Level five, we're getting extra attack and fast movement. 
Obviously, these are both great. Fast movement, you're getting an extra 10 feet of movement. And that is something now to just start keeping track of all this. We're getting advantage on dexterity, saving throws. You've got all the things that you get with a normal rage, plus all the, the, the crazy stuff from the wild magic as a possibility. And now you've got extra movement. So your ability to get anywhere is one uh, another one of those things that I, I think is often overlooked with the Barbarian. That extra 10 feet of movement is extremely valuable. Even if you're tanking, getting to the spot that you want to protect on the map isn't just necessarily right in front of your party. You may want to go at the enemy and form a, form a spot and let the party come in behind you. In particular, with the play style that this kind of Barbarian has, where you want to be within 30 feet of a target before you rage, that just that extra 10 feet of movement makes it even more valuable because now you're really able to get to the spots where you can inflict the most havoc, the most damage, whatever, when the rage happens if you get one of those area of effect uh, abilities. And at level 5, our damage is going to jump to 29 uh, around, which is uh, great. But remember, you're getting 14.5 per swing on average. So if you should drop something to zero, if you should crit, that's another 14.5. And then you have all the different possibilities from the wild magic. So I would think it's safe to say that at this point, you could be looking at yourself consistently as being in the low 30s, 33-ish would, would be, sounds about right to me. But things like uh, the retributive effect that you're getting when you're getting an extra D6 from every attack that hits you, uh, that could really bump things up radically. And of course, like I said, with the, the random effect from Great Weapon Master, you just never know. So you your, your damage at minimum on average will be 29 and it could get much better. So at level six, we get bolstering magic. So as an action, you can touch a character and that character could receive one of two benefits. It could be that for 10 minutes, that character adds a D3 to attack rolls and, and ability checks, and they can add that to their D20. Or the character recovers a spell slot. That spell slot will be of a level that that D3 will also determine. So you roll a D3 in either case, in this case, for what level of spell. There are a couple of problems with uh, using it to recover spell slots. One is, of course, that you're not sure what level they're going to get back. So depending on the caster you're giving it to, are you giving them a wasted slot? So if you're helping a wizard recover a first level spell, and here we are at sixth level, great, now, sh now they can cast shield again. Is that that big of a whoop? I mean, it is to the wizard, but is it going to be that helpful overall? If it's a third level slot that you're giving to the wizard, and that's another hypnotic pattern, well, that's a whole different story, but you have no way of knowing that. Further, if they don't have an expended spell slot for the, the one that they roll, that's the spell slot they recover. So it could be potentially wasted, although... I wouldn't imagine that you would ever do this in such a situation, but you need to be aware that that is a possibility. So it isn't a D3 a value of spell slots. It's one spell slot that is equal to the level that you roll. And that's the difference. If it were a D3 worth of spell levels, that would be much, much different. So for that reason, I think that you really want to be considering, oddly enough, that the D3 for 10 minutes is going to be what you are going to want to use it for because that D3 with Great Weapon Master is incredibly useful. So your average potential damage that you can be doing around is 46, not counting stuff from the Rage or not counting uh, extra bonus action attacks. So that 12.5% of that 46 is 5.5 points of damage that you could be doing per round. The problem with it is, is of course it takes an action to confer this. So it's no good to use this in combat because you'll never recover what you're giving up by giving up your action. So when you have the opportunity, if you're about, if you're in a dungeon situation is where this will really shine is 
before you open a door, if you're relatively confident that there's a tar- a uh, an enemy on the other side of the door, go ahead and use it. It'll last for 10 minutes. That could last for potentially two encounters. If you're getting a five and a half point jump in damage on top of all the other stuff that could happen randomly, now you're doing crazy damage. This is where I mentioned, you know, being the the master of great weapon master, nobody else can do this. You can get the effect through a magic weapon or someone casting bless on you, which is another great point here, is that a cleric is a great choice if you're going to restore spell levels. A cleric is a great choice because no matter what spell level you give the cleric, it's always going to be useful somehow in healing or, or whatever. And even a first level spell... It could turn into Bless, which could come back to you and give you essentially the same thing that you would have gotten if you'd used it as a D3 for yourself. So it may seem like an easy call to always use it for spells. I really don't think so. I think you should be looking at it as a a 50-50 and then use it as a situational. If if you have another use for it that will be better for you, then go ahead and use it. If it's going to be useful to a spellcaster, then use that. So again flexibility. You really have to think of this character from a very flexible standpoint, but it gives you that potential to really be a powerhouse with Great Weapon Master. And you, uh, maybe of all the characters, I think you could be just a, a bit more selfish here with that, because it's one thing you've got that's reliable. <laughs> one power that you've got that really nobody else gets anything quite like that, that you can count on. So I would I would want to hold on to it. I mean the the spells are good and all, but I I would you're you're a fighter. You fight. You're a barbarian. You fight. You you that D three is very valuable with Great Weapon Master. And at level six now we get four rages, and of course that's great because now you're pretty much assured. It's not a hundred percent of the time that you're going to be able to use a rage every single combat, but probably. Okay, so that's the bulk of. The stuff that really needs to be talked about, we'll just kind of skip through the rest of the levels pretty quickly here. So level 7 and level 8. Level 7, you gain uh, Feral Instinct. This is fantastic ability because you're getting advantage on initiative rolls. And uh, when you consider, again, the, the compound effect of all of these things... Your ability to, to go quickly in the turn and with fast movement to get to that within 30 feet of the enemy... So that when your, your rage pops, it's going to have the, the best possible chance of doing something to the enemy is great. Or be able to hit a high value target and hit them quickly. Fantastic. In addition, if you are surprised, if the party is surprised, you can still take your action provided that the first part of your action is to rage. So it, realistically, it's like saying, here's alert at 7th level for all barbarians because it does almost the exact same thing. But if you actually ever wanted to take alert, it works even more beautifully because you're gaining advantage with Feral Instinct and alert, of course, gives you a plus five. So they would work together. And at level eight, we get our ASI. And of course, we're just going to take our strength to 20. Level nine, we get Brutal Critical. And at ninth level, the rage damage jumps to from a plus two to a plus three, which is great. So between those two effects are... Average damage now is 33.3, not counting anything you might get from uh, critical hits from Great Weapon Master dropping an enemy to zero from Great Weapon Master or anything that you could get from all the random rage effects. At level 10, we gain unstable backlash. Whenever you take damage or you fail a saving throw, you can use your reaction to immediately roll on the wild magic table for your rage. Whenever you roll, that effect Whatever effect you rolled takes effect immediately and now becomes the new effect of the rage. This is a great way for you to be able to get potentially get out of a roll that you didn't like. You're going to get hit. So this is a a great way to be able to, if you say roll to four and you got the thrown weapon and you didn't want that, as soon as you get hit, you get another chance at it. So level 10 from this point forward, getting stuck with a bad roll on rage or one that you don't like as much or isn't as effective in this current situation, you can get another crack at it. 
And at level 11, you get Relentless Rage. So if you are dropped to zero and you're raging, you can uh, make a DC saving throw of 10, uh, Constitution saving throw of 10. If you make that, you can elect to have one hit point instead. Anytime you do it after that, the DC increases by five and then it resets at a short rest. So effects like this are really, really good but you have to be careful with that. I mean, you obviously want to use it, but just because you have one hit point and you didn't drop, you're still in a horribly perilous situation because your 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 damage reduction isn't going to save you. So you really need to be thinking about if if that should happen to you and it, your action comes up. What are you going to do? Because you have to come up with something defensive. It's, if it's going to be dodge, or maybe you could finish the enemy off. And if you feel like you could finish the enemy off, maybe you should. It. My, my point is, it, I really love abilities like this, but they can make you feel a bit overconfident, and you shouldn't be overconfident with this ability. And at level 12, we gain the ASI, and of course, yeah, I would bump the constitution at this point. And at level 12... We also get five rages a day, so now you you should be covered. <laughs> but, I mean, you are a 12 level character, for goodness sake. I don't know why they did rages like this for the Barbarian. It's the, the biggest complaint I have. Level 13, we get Brutal Critical again, so yet another die roll whenever you crit. Always nice. And at level 14, we get Controlled Surge on the Wild Magic Table. So now you get to roll twice, pick which one you want, and if you roll doubles, you pick any effect on the table. So it, as you get more powerful, you gain the ability to gain some leverage over the luck. And like I said, at level six, you gain that ability to have something consistently useful with that D3 for attack rolls. So it, the, the character progresses out of just sheer luck to having more control. And now w with this kind of an ability to be able to la largely just get to the one you want. If any of those powers really appeal to you, it's a very fun way to play a barbarian. So I I really, I, I like the class. I like the fact that, I like the randomness of it. I like the challenge of it. Like I said before, barbarians are just the mechanics of them by themselves are very, very strong. So is it better than being a bear totem barbarian? Well, I mean, bear totem is going to be a lot more reliable, but it doesn't do anything like what you're doing here. And it's that level six ability with the D3 or having the option to be able to uh, get spell slots back that really is the, the thing that makes the difference to me for this character. Well, that's all I have. If you enjoyed the video, please like, please share, please subscribe. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please do check out the Patreon. And if you're stuck and you don't know where to go, you can always search for a secret door. Until next time, I cast Bless on all of you.